There was a time when many of your clothes were homemade and you would walk into a fabric store and see a wall of filing cabinets stuffed full of paper patterns with names like McCall, Butterwick, Simplicity, and more. Today's guest, Stephanie Canada, is a vintage pattern reseller, searching out those old patterns that people find when they're downsizing or clearing out homes. And she's gonna tell us all about her adventures. And I did ask her how she got that surname. So grab your sewing and a cup of tea, and here's my interview with Stephanie Canada. So welcome, Stephanie, to the show. Whereabouts in the world are you coming to us from? I am from, well, I'm not from, woo, I live in Orlando, Florida. <laughs> not from there, very important point, not from here. Well, my next question is, were you originally from Orlando? No, this glow in the dark certainly did not get birthed here. I am born in Pennsylvania and I was raised just north of Cincinnati, Ohio for the majority of my life. Okay, so how did you end up with the name Stephanie Canada? I married into those shenanigans. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was kidding when he's like, yeah, my name's last name is Canada. I said, no. He's like, no, seriously, I'm a meme. And I was like, what are you talking about? My husband was in the U.S. Army. And so you see U.S. Army and then right below it is Canada. He is that meme. That is him. You must just get asked about that all the time. All the time. All we the time. went into Canada actually last July, and I was surprised at how calm the Border Patrol was at our last name. I was hoping for a bigger reaction. They were very calm. They were amused, but very calm. <laughs> Are there a, a lot of Canadas? Um, In Knoxville, Tennessee, there is. Okay. <laughs> I don't know the full genealogy of his family, but I do know that they've lived in Knoxville a very long time, but their numbers are like the last name is dwindling out because he is the only son of his dad who was also the only son. So like it is sort of on its last lineage unless my daughter decides just to keep her name because she thinks it's funny, which I will two thumbs up. Absolutely recommend that because it's, it's hilarious. I'm not even going to lie about that. <laughs> Well, it lends itself so well to YouTube. What a great handle. Uh, the number of people that have followed me because they thought I was like Stephanie from Canada is not zero. <laughs> <laughs> there, the number of comments I get that are like, wait, you're not in Canada? You're not from Canada? I'm like, no, I. it's Nothing called you do marriage, with... folks. <laughs> <laughs> so I should quiz you on some Canada facts later to see how many... <laughs> I mean, you can. No. I will probably get a zero out of 10 unless it's, does maple syrup come from trees? And then that one will be a solid yes. Other than that, no clue. How did you get into reselling fabric? Uh, reselling fabric was actually not the first foray. The first foray into selling vintage was reselling vintage sewing patterns. Because as a little kid, I grew up in my mom's sewing room and I would just sit and play with beads or do other crafts while she was sewing. But the one thing I distinctly remember getting to help her do was always pick out the pattern she was going to make for my grandmother because she would make my her mom's clothes for her on occasion. And so I would always get to pick out the pattern. Unfortunately, I did lose my mother in 2011. And I was sort of in this place where 25-year-old, barely fully formed frontal cortex, lose your mother, big trauma... And you're just sort of floating there going, how do I continue my mother's legacy? How do I keep her alive? And I went into this antique store that I was on. I was going on a lunch break and I go to the very back room and in the back room was this little hat box. And inside the little hat box was a whole bunch of 1960s patterns, one of which I distinctly remember that she had in her collection and they only wanted a dollar for them. And they were, they had never been used. They'd never been touched. You know, like somebody from home ec had bought like 12 patterns, used one. That was the situation. But I was like, man, these are cool. And this is right when Etsy was like, and it's like sort of like almost to like the, the heyday, right before all the fees and the annoying things kicked in. So my uncle was like, why don't you just buy these? Cause I was on the phone with them talking about something else. He was like, no, you should put those on Etsy. So instead of just having a paper store, which I had at the time, he also was like, you should have a vintage store too. That way you can sort of help people like stay in touch with your mom that way. Like 
she loves sewing patterns. You clearly love sewing patterns because otherwise, why are you looking at a hat box full of them? So I bought about 10 and I tried reselling them. And uh, that was the kicker. That was the little like the little sparkle that was like, oh, it's fun. It's easy to do. And at the time I was a traveling stage manager. And so I was going around the country in my little toaster on wheels. And I had a little bit of room, not too much room. So I kept two small, thin plastic totes full of my stock. And I would drive around my little work jobs. And then on my days off, I would list the patterns that I had found in that town. And then they would sell and I'd go to the post office and then it just kept snowballing and bigger and bigger. And then you get one sewing pattern cabinet. Then you get two sewing pattern cabinets. Now I have five. Little much. Not going to lie about that. <laughs> but that whole snowball effect turned into, oh, well, my patterns are doing so well. Why don't I try, you know, listing some of the fabric that I have so that people can buy a pattern and fabric if they like it? And so that's sort of how we've gotten into, I bought an entire estate sale and now it's all in my garage and a storage unit. We'll get to talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> so did you like vintage fabric and patterns right from the beginning? Like that was the angle of vintage or you've just kind of slid into there because of what you're finding? No, I always really liked the vintage ones. Um, even before I, you know, got into selling them, I, I remember going to the patterns with my mother and I would always be drawn to the ones that sort of looked like the older styles before, like this is before they would do like the reproduction patterns. And my mom and I would go and she'd be like, Stephanie, why, why do you like all these older styles? I'm like, I don't know, mom, I think they're cute. But she would make them for me, you know, when she had time. <laughs> and it's just something I've always been drawn to. I love the silhouettes of the 50s without the values of the 50s. Like we love the fashion. That's where it stops. <laughs> I'm very attracted to them too because of the fittedness of them. I don't like like dropped shoulders and things like that. Like because I have a big bust line and I'm a big person, it's so easy for me to look like a blob. Yeah, and that's what I like. Actually, um, this is a Disney dress shop dress. I didn't put on one of the ones that I made. But they also for a while did the 50s looks. And so it's, you know, it's the same thing. I like the gathers through here. The And it's like got a nice like fitted waist and a big fluffy skirt and pockets because pockets <laughs> are life. <laughs> pockets are valuable. So do you just have an online store or do you do fairs and craft shows and things like that? I primarily just do online. I tried to do some vintage fairs here in Orlando what I found was that one, I am not designed for outdoor activities in Florida. I get overheated so fast. And then to top it all off, you're under a tent and you you have like one little fan. Yeah, it's, it doesn't go well for me. And while some of the fairs would be good, like I, I guess I just never found like my jam or my groove of like which fairs really worked best for my product. And the problem is, is the product that I was hauling around was things like this, this lovely lady, yeah. except, you know, a lot of them, because if you don't have a lot of them, no one's really going to buy it. Because like I tried to bring sewing patterns a few times and no one would buy them. Like maybe like one or two would sell because that's not the audience for sewing patterns. The audience for sewing patterns is more online. So it's also a lot easier because then I don't have to tote things around in my little toaster anymore. You've talked about your patterns and from watching your state sale videos, it gave me flashbacks and just thinking of part of the economy that's not there anymore. You used to be able to go into a fabric store and see like files and files and files of these things. And I mean, they couldn't stock them in just one size. In those days, everything was just one size and you, yeah. there wasn't five sizes on a pattern. And I thought it was also interesting that you categorize your pattern factory folded. I love that. <laughs> Yeah, it's one of the things that I learned really early on is that people really love when they're factory folded. 1945, this was issued, pressed on a machine, probably folded by a human, rogue idea here, put in, a, you know, put in an envelope, and then it has literally time traveled its happy self all the way to the year of our Lord 2024, waiting for you to come get it. That aspect is, is really intriguing to people. I mean, it's really intriguing to me because for some unknown reason, probably about every three of four patterns that I like make for my channel 
I don't even really realize it until I go to use it. And I go, son of a, how did I pick another factory folded one? <laughs> so even my brain goes, ooh, time travel time. I don't know other than the collectability of them, because then you know that whatever is inside was from the factory. So if there's a mistake in there, it wasn't a human intervened and, you know, ha 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 ha, I didn't put back a belt or the waistline stay. Who it's the lining piece. <laughs> Yeah, right? <laughs> oh, who needs that strap? Let's cut that in half. Come on now, I'm, let's I'm not. never going to make this with small, with short sleeves. I'm going to throw out that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this skirt's like four inches too short. Yoink. We don't need the extension pieces. Okay, sure. <laughs> that doesn't make me itch. <laughs> well, I was laughing to myself because one of the first things I would always do when I bought a pattern was I would pull it all out and then cut out all the excess tissue because one of the things that really bugged me when I went to make something was I had to deal with all this extra tissue and it was an added step and my mother used to say Karen you have the largest collection of cut patterns of anyone probably <laughs> I, like, I probably only made one out of every five. Oh wow so you took yeah. the time to cut them all out and then still didn't use them all well I realize now it was probably part of my ADD, you know, like I couldn't just sit and watch a TV show. I had to be doing something. Ah, that's yeah. what I would do while I was watching TV. Oh, that makes sense. So tell us about this estate sale. It's just like just watching that quantity of fabric. Tell me about the original person who owned the store. What I know of the estate sale is what has been told to me from my friends who gave me the lead originally. The person who originally owned the store, it was called Miss Ruth's Dress Shop. So if you buy a pattern from me and you see Ruth's dress shop on the label, that's her stamp that she would stamp every single pattern that she was selling with. So you knew where you got it from. Uh, her name was Ruth Gowdy. And somewhere about 1965, I believe, she realized, I mean, she was a very good seamstress and she was sewing for everyone in town, but on a very small scale. So like, oh, I need a prom dress for this. Oh, I need, you know, a, a, br a bridal gown, this, that, and the other. And then she realized that she could open her own store. So she opened Ruth's Dress Shop somewhere about in the middle 1960s. And she was the only dressmaker in town for, as far as I know ever, because it was a very small town in South Carolina. She was working and doing all this stuff and she was the person you would go to. So she had all the stock, all the colors, all the trims and everything. By the time the late 70s, early 80s rolled around, she realized that, you know, I think I'm about done with this. So in 1981, I don't know the exact day. I wish I did just to, you know, commemorate it somehow. But in 1981, she decided that she was done. And she didn't really do a clear out sale. She didn't really do much of anything other than turned off the lights, closed the door, locked it and walked away. And then... It stayed in that state because she owned the building. Like it was her building, but <laughs> she didn't ever go there. And she had passed away sometime. I'm not exactly sure when, but I want to say sometime in the 2000s range. And her son had looked at the will and went, Ruth's dress shop. Why did I get Ruth? We still own the dress shop. So he contacted one of her best friends to ask her if she wanted to help clear through the estate and her, you know, uh, Miss Esther, who was in one of my videos agreed to do that. And they went in and they did all the heavy lifting. They went into the building. They found, unfortunately, like a section of the roof had collapsed. So there's a, unfortunately, like a couple truckloads that had to be thrown away just because of 40 years of the, who knows when it collapsed, but it definitely collapsed. But thankfully, most of it was perfectly fine. They said you walked in, you felt like you were walking into 1981. It's just wild to think about. So they took it on and they sold through it, I want to say for about two and a half years. They were working on selling through it, selling through it, selling through it. And I got reached out to by a friend on Instagram to go out and, you know, we were all going to do videos. So we did that. I think it was fall of 2021 because we had all just gotten our first round of vaccines, I believe. And we were all masking still trying to keep our distance. But holy mercy, it was hot because we were there in the heat of South Carolina. And we're all going through, we're having a good time. And we all do videos, all three of us, uh, myself, my friend Haley Marie Vintage, and uh, another wonderful channel called So So Drew. 
who we're all vintage sewists, so we all like were making up stuff from the estate sale as well. I knew that they were still going to be selling through it because we had all put their information in our videos. Like, here's how you contact them to buy directly from them. We appreciated the fact that we were able to come in and make the video and do all this. So we wanted to like give back and link their original information. And they apparently, according to my friend, were, were busy for months after that because they were getting so many emails from all of our videos. It, I think it's a really interesting way to like not only talking about keeping my mother's legacy alive, but keeping Miss Ruth's legacy alive. Like she clearly saw purpose for all of these fabrics, all of these patterns, and now we get to help them find new homes. And so that was lovely. And I, we had talked originally when I went about going back potentially, but nothing had really come of it. And then flash forward two years later, when I'm like starting to think like, okay, I think our time in Florida is, you know, kind of, starting to wrap itself up. Like, let's kind of like button up some stuff here. I get a text message. Hey, would you still like to come back for uh, the second half of this estate? What? Uh, you still have things? <laughs> I think at the time when we went in 2021, I didn't realize that what we were looking at wasn't everything. There was still two giant trailers that they had stocked full and they hadn't even touched her office yet so two years later i go back after some like negotiations because like i had one price they had another and we kind of went back and forth and then they decided they were like you know what it's fine just come take it just come take it it's gonna be your problem not ours so i did so i show up my 15 foot box truck because i think a 15 foot box truck is overkill it was not we get there and we load it up and i walk and i'm like oh boy because they had emptied out the entire building now and so now i could see everything that was there and i was like oh no oh no okay this is gonna be fun <laughs> I, I cannot believe that that's the remains of what they've already sold like you had picked so much and you left so much behind as well yeah i had to uh a lot of the stuff that i left behind some of it was still good to be donated a lot of it needed to find the landfill to complete its decomposition right it was um, near that hole in the ceiling i guess yeah and bless them they saved as much as they could they really did and i applaud them for that people especially in the video were commenting like why didn't you go back why didn't you go get a bigger truck and i'm like without fully understanding the complete ramifications of what you're asking the question is valid but oh, also, I wanted to ask that. Why did you go back with another truck? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you. So we had gotten there. We'd driven overnight. So we had woken up at 7.30 in the morning. We go to U-Haul to pick up our 15-foot box truck, which personally, me, not having a full ramification, because you don't get a full view of what I was looking at from the pictures that I was sent. It looks like a lot, but it doesn't look overwhelming. So I was like, 15-foot, this is going to be, and I kid you not, overkill i thought i was going to have to tie things down so hard because the root truck was going to be too empty so i get my 15 foot box truck and i get there and the u-haul bless their little cotton socks their computers i believe were from 1995 along with the aol cd disc to start up the internet because like we stood there for easily an hour just to rent the u-haul and i was like y'all i got a I gotta go because the problem is, is that where this dress shop estate sale was located, it was quite literally an hour and 15 minutes from either U-Haul. There is no U-Haul. There's no rental in that little town. So we were already now running late because we were supposed to be there at nine. Cause I thought, ah, get there when they open, get the truck, get on the road. We'll be there by nine 30. Well, it was eight 30 and we were still sitting there and I was like, cool. This is going well. So we finally get the truck, we get down there. We are so completely late by the time we get everything because also when I got the truck, there were ants in the cabin. And I don't mean like one or two. I'm talking like I opened the door and you could see the colony going up and around the corner. They were, I was like, oh, this is awful. But it was the last 15 footer they had. So I didn't have a choice. I didn't think I would need more truck. So I was like, no, 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 no. I just need this truck. So just bomb them and I will wait a little bit so that I don't breathe in the fumes. But we get this truck, we finally get down there. They also gave me a truck that had a quarter of a tank and guess what that thing eats through? Gas. 
So I had to go get gas. So like by the time we get down there, my friends have been pre-packing boxes that I have not seen for two hours because we don't get there until about 1130. So they have been going since 930, packing boxes, packing everything. And my husband and daughter beat me there. And all I get is this message while I'm at a stop sign. And I look at it really quickly and they're like, please message me when you get here. I need the camera. Okay. So not only am I an hour and 15 minutes from any U-Haul place, as far as timing goes, there was no way for me to get back there. I've also now got my husband telling me that he needs the camera ASAP as soon as I get there. So now I'm concerned that I've done something wrong. And I pull up and my friend, they get the look on my face as I go through the door when I realize what I have done. Because I looked around, I was like, oh no. You want me to take all of this because in our original text message chain, it was, do you want all the sewing stuff? What is the, what does sewing stuff conjure for you? That would be notions and maybe some small tools, but mostly fabric. Yes. Interfacing maybe. Right. They wanted me to take all the sewing stuff. Yes. So the one, two, three, four, five, six bins full of trim all the fabric, all the patterns, all the cabinets, which I knew about. That was what I was excited for was the, the more sewing the pattern cabinets, <laughs> right? We're excited for that. We're not mad about that. What's why I got the one with the little roller ramp and all the mannequins, all the finished clothing, all the displays for all of this. I'm like, no, oh, oh, wait, wait, I'm taking displays now. So what I think she meant to say was, I want you to buy the entire store like the entire sewing shop, which meant that she had vintage hose, vintage displays, all this stuff that I was like, I'm, I was not truckly prepared for that. My friend Heather still to this day goes, uh, Steph, you, you really should have just called me. I'm like, I know, I know I should have just called you, man. I know, I know I messed it up. The main reason why we didn't leave, why I didn't like immediately leave and go get another truck not only was it going to be basically three hours round trip, because God knows how long it would take that poor place to get their computers, you know, uh, up and running again. But also, I lost all the help at 2 p.m. So either it was going to be me, my husband, and my daughter loading a 24-foot truck, or I was going to load the 15-foot truck with six people. I knew which one. I, I knew which one was the answer. And the thing was, is like I, I'm, I'm a little sad about it. But I'm also not really because while there is a goal to eventually have my own antique store where people can actually physically come and like see like a wall full of fabric and all of this stuff, we're not there yet. <laughs> but yeah, that, that would be why I did not return to go get a 24 foot box truck. It was mainly the fact that there was no way between my husband and myself, what we would have taken the entire night. Yeah. Whereas with six of us, we got it from 1130. We were able to leave and have eaten by 430 PM. It was an easy choice, unfortunately. And also because the folk, you know, the folks that are there were just like, we'll just donate the rest of it. I said, okay, great. Fine by me. So was this the first estate that you've ever purchased? Yes. In its entire, yes. I have been estate sailing for quite some time, but this is the very first time I have ever bought an entire estate sale. So how do you find out about these estate sales? Do you, is it word of mouth or is there a directory or a website somewhere? Well, if you're just going shopping for like a regular person who wants to go try an estate sale, estatesales.net, that is my go-to. And what I will do is there's a little search bar. So I always search by sewing or fabric or sewing machine to try and find ones in my areas that I feel like are going to be a bit more of what I'm looking for. But as far as buying the entire thing, I will be very honest when I say I lucked into this. A friend of a friend told me about it. I flew to South Carolina the first time to buy the first time from them. You know, two and a half years later, the entire thing's my problem now. <laughs> so because of the YouTube channel that I have, where I've sort of cultivated like a vintage and, you know, estate sale finds and sewing shenanigans channel, I actually do have people that will reach out to me because they either have 
a box of their mother's or great aunt's sewing patterns and they really don't want them to go to the trash and they don't care that they find new homes and get sold on my website. They just want to make sure that they don't end up in the dumpster. So I, I am lucky enough to have a wonderful audience who's also like, here, please take this and find a new home. Either it's paid or a donation or I cover the shipping, you know, or I mentioned them in the video. So like there's all these ways that, you know, folks feel seen and get to have like, oh, my great aunt's sewing pattern finally found a new home where maybe it's going to get made now. And I love being the person to facilitate that because I think it's fun. If I could only have a, a pattern channel where all I did was unbox patterns, people would get really old of it really fast. But like, I would have a great time because <laughs> all I want to do is like open every box on camera and be like, look at this. It's so pretty. Well, I watched one of your unboxing ones and they can be uh, quite addictive. These Those episodes you think, going, oh, what's next? And what's yeah. next? And, and it's funny if you had just seen a pile of patterns sitting there you might not get so enthusiastic, but when you are showing, oh, look at this, this is factory folded and this is the size and this is what you could do with it or whatever. I'm thinking, oh, well, maybe I could make that. It gives more life to the pattern. And that's what I want to do because even if the folks can't buy like that pattern, because I will say when I do those boxes and I drop the patterns on my website, they do go pretty quickly. It's very rare that I have more than 10 or 20% of the box left by the time I'm done. But what I love is then other people will then go find a similar pattern and be like, oh, look, I found this one in my size because of your video. I'm so excited to make it. And I love that because I, I just want to put just an ounce of what I see in these patterns into the person watching because I think they're the coolest things. What else do you know that is vintage? that can be used that many times and still not only hold value, but give you a product as if you have time traveled. Like, the, I, I'm sorry, I don't think there is any. I'm just, I'm gonna be bold. I don't think there's anything else. You Sure, you can still use vintage appliances and you can feel like you've time traveled, but you get there's more maintenance into those because the parts are older, they're harder to find if something breaks. Like, this is a little itty bitty piece of paper that you can turn into one or a thousand garments if you have the ma the structure for it. You don't get that from anything else. And I love it. So when you're looking at fabric or a pattern, what is the first thing that you're looking for? How do you to judge whether it's a good thing or a bad or a bad thing? The the most obvious is how does the envelope look? Because a lot of the times, if the envelope is shredded and falling apart, a lot of the times your pattern's probably not going to be much better. Nine times out of 10, if that envelope is shredded, so is the pattern. Then the next thing that I really look for is we're still on the envelope. We haven't even pulled it out yet, but I'm really looking for, do I see any water damage? Do I see any discolorations? Something that would tell me that this has been stored so improperly that I need to either rethink about opening it or you know, just be mindful because a lot of the times, like the envelope might look perfectly fine, but you open up the pattern you see, because the brown paper shows it better than the white paper, you see this water line. So then you go back to the envelope. I love patterns. I love them so much. I, if I had my way, I would find a way to fix them all. It's not always possible. And that's just something that I've had to make my peace with, especially with this estate sale. There have been some, I'm like, I literally can't save this. It does hurt. It hurts my soul. Not going to lie about that. Like I hate, I hate having to like recycle them or because some of them are so bad that I'm like, nope, nope, nope. That is a health hazard to the absolute most. I'm not going anywhere near that. And neither should anyone else because I feel like what's so good about the pattern is the lines, is the design, is the functionality of it. If you lose all of those, to mold, mildew, water, dogs, cats, bobs. It's a running joke about my mice on my channel. There's only so much we can do. Even though it feels like you're never going to see this pattern again. Gotta let I bet go. you will. <laughs> I bet you will. We all just need to like, just remember, this was not like a, some small bespoke company making one-offs. This is the big four, y'all. 
<laughs> back when it was the big four. Well, actually, there was more than four. These were mass produced items. Somewhere out there is another one. Will it take a little bit to find? Maybe. Or you might be able to go to eBay, Etsy, Mercari, you know, pick your reselling pleasure. Somebody probably has one somewhere. That's kind of where I go in with that. Like you start with the envelope. How does the envelope look? Does it look okay? Okay, great. The next thing you go in is, you know, do you open up the pattern. Do you see a water line? Things like that. that maybe you couldn't see on the envelope. And then beyond there to go full swing the other way, like what are like the best, what's the absolute most, you know, amazing thing I love. And then they get, they're obviously getting fewer and fewer. When you find ones from the 40s and the 50s, the envelopes are just pristine. The colors are there. Everything's there. The seams are still together, which is sort of one of the first things to break down just because of the fold. And you open up that thing and there it is. It's never been touched. And it's like, I am a time traveler now. I have traveled back to when this pattern was made. And that's like the best feeling that I get. So it goes all, you, you get both sides. And you just mentioned that they were mass produced. So I guess none of this qualifies to be in a museum if it's a, if you get a pristine one. While I do believe some of them belong in museums, especially ones that are pre-1920, because those are the ones that would be made on the much more, you know, handmade presses. This is when sewing was starting to become more accessible to everyone. Things like from 1885, 1890, those I feel like at this point with survivor bias being built in, knowing that as people use them, they get worse and worse and just end up disintegrating. Those, anything pre-1900, I think should qualify, even though they were probably made on, you know, big machines. But once you get into, I want to say the 40s, I feel like that's where we start to like one that's where they like they really pushed sewing pattern ramp up ramp up ramp up ramp up into the 50s and then they tried to keep pushing in the 60s with a decline so i would say things that are like pre-war pre-42 but it's also kind of fun to think that like in some world war ii collection wouldn't it be cool if you showed here are the patterns that were made here's how they're different from the ones previous because they certainly are <laughs> oh my gosh the paper texture the ability of the envelope to withstand time and the tissue all of it's different they all feel different from the 30s patterns it's wild so yeah i really think that anything pre-42 belongs has a place in a museum, but I also think that it still has a place in private collections, you know, that people own and make from because they're meant to be used. And we have online databases in a perfect world. There would be one online database as a part of archive.org where you could just go and look at every sewing pattern ever because most of us take the time to scan them in. That doesn't exist yet. The closest thing you can get is the Vintage Pattern Wiki, where you can go, and there's over 100,000 entries, so there's a lot of patterns on there. So you can kind of get the feel of, like, 1930s pattern, 1940s pattern. That's one thing that I wish museums would do. I know that there is one museum in, I believe it's Rhode Island? that has a huge collection. There's also one in California that has a huge collection, but they're also both behind a paywall. I personally think that just for pattern covers, I'm not saying you have to make the whole pattern available because, you know, whatever, but just the pattern covers, I feel like should be somewhere else that is just free to look through and catalog and just for fun. Have you dug into the history of any of these patterns? Like, do you know any of the dressmaker, like the the designers that made them other than, you know, Calvin Klein and uh, Betsy Johnson and things like that. Like the ones that are no named. I tried one time because the one thing to know about me, as much as I love the history of these, I like the, the history of who made them, not who designed them. Okay. But one thing that I have lurked and in, looked into and unfortunately did not get very far. So if any of your audience has any information, I will take it because I am still so freaking curious. In 
I want to say it was 2019, I got reached out to about two drawers full of New York patterns. New York is a company that went out of business in the early 1950s. I want to say it was like 53. And on the front, it says the name of a designer made, you know, designed by this person. I have dug and begged and pleaded for anyone to have any information on this person and no one knows who they are. The only thing that we can think of at this point, and by we, I mean, me and my friend, uh, Mrs. Depew, who also is a big, she's much more into like the history part of it than I am. I, I just like to chaotically make things and stare at pretty patterns. She's the historian. <laughs> so she even used all of her tools. And the only thing that we can think of is that it's the same type of designed by as I think it was Betsy McCall in the sixties or Nancy McCall, basically like McCall's made like this one person who answered all the pattern questions and designed all these clothes. It was never actually, you know, one person. It was several editors and people that changed, like just answering questions and things like that. So it was never just one person. It was all of these people. So the only thing that we can think of is that it was sort of like that. It was like a facade di designer so that people felt like it was fancier than it was. But we, I don't know. I don't know. That's the only time I've dug into something like that and just met with air there nothing but air there is no person that i can find that has this name that designed in new york city it just doesn't it just isn't there so we were thinking it might have been like a, a last hurrah because they really started to print that designer name on patterns from like 49 up through about 51 which was you can tell by what they were putting out they were already kind of starting to struggle that's the only thing we can think of i know you just love vintage patterns when did you start getting into vintage fabrics so I had already always had an affinity for the big border prints, the really cute novelty designs. But I got really into it actually during lockdown because I was an opera stage manager and I had lost all of my work. It was gone, poof, gone, completely gone and no timeline of return. And so I was panicking. I was like, I don't know how, how are we going to pay our bills? How are we going to eat food? I, I don't know that answer. And a friend of mine uh, who was not as badly affected because her job was able to go remote was like, listen, I've been dealing with lockdown by trolling eBay and looking for cheap fabric that people don't know what it's worth, but I know what it's worth and you know what it's worth. Can I help you find things? And then you can sell them. And then we'll just give me a little finder's fee. I said, Absolutely. <laughs> And that's sort of what got me into fabric was my friend trying to make sure that I could eat and that I could feed my kid. That connection with fabric has, you know, sort of turned into a, a slight, slight problem where now I need to declutter the stuff that I'm really not going to use. But it really started during the height of the lockdown because it was an outlet for me, not only to make money, but also to, again, get to like touch and feel these things because something about vintage fabric just feels nicer to me than modern fabric. Do I still make things out of modern fabric? Yeah, sure. Of course I do. Because it's easily available. Not a problem. But there's something that's so much finer and nicer about the feel of vintage cottons, vintage rayons, vintage silks. Yeah, it was really the lockdown that did it. So what was the learning curve on fabric as opposed to patterns? Uh, it's still going. <laughs> <laughs> There is so much more nuance to fabric than there is to patterns. Patterns, you've got to, it's quite simple. When's it from? Is it complete? What is the status of its completedness? End of it, it, it like end of list. That's it. <laughs> there are three things you need to know. Fabric is so much more nuanced. And I'm honest, I'm not gonna lie, I'm still learning. I am still learning. Uh, thankfully, when my friend offered to do this for me, she would go and then tell me, okay, I think it's this type of cotton. Because she was like, I've had this before and I have felt it and did a burn test and this is what mine was. Here's how you do this. And they linked me all of this stuff to help me really start this process. And so it's something I still learn. You know, I have a burn test chart that I use religiously because I don't remember the difference of smells all the time. The only thing I remember is silk because silk smells like burning hair. And that is such a distinct smell. It's really hard for me to forget, <laughs> but the learning curve is, is a lot steeper in fabric, but it's all still doable because even at the, at the base, 
even if you just know a basic fiber content, you know, it's cotton, but it's blended with a synthetic. Okay, great. So now people know like, oh, there might be poly in there. There might be, it might be blended with, you know, God knows what, especially vintage fabric, like who knows what random name for polyester they picked out that day because it's 1% different than any other type of polyester. They made some wild names. It's been a lot but it's a fun challenge. Do I always get it right? No, but the part of being an online vintage seller is going, this is the best that I can figure out. Cause I know in theater school, they actually teach you burn tests and how to go like really nitty gritty into, oh, well, well, it's slightly burning like this. So it's this. And it, I didn't get those classes. I only got base level costuming. I did not go that deep. So I know there are people that are going to know more about what these are. And if as a vintage seller, I have messed up and I sold someone linen and it's cotton, you know, back in the early days, because I didn't really know the difference, then that's on me to fix. And it's what I do because at the end of the day, fabric is such a nuance that either you sell it for a bottom barrel because you don't know what it is and you don't care to learn what it is, or you try and learn what it is, and you're really working hard, but you're going to make mistakes sometimes. And that just means that sometimes you have to try and make it right. Speaking of working hard, you need to do a number of different steps before it can go online. Like you've got to photograph it in a couple of different ways. What else do you do? So what I try and do with the photographs is I try and get an overall shot. So people can see what the design is. And then what I do is I try and get a swirl shot so that you can sort of see, you know, oh, this thing really doesn't want to swirl. It just wants to like drape weirdly or wow, that takes a swirl really nicely. That's going to drape really well on, on the body. And the other important thing that I try and get is defects because with vintage fabric, unlike modern fabric where you're like, you know, you can take a top down, a swirl, and a scale rule so that way you know, you know, oh, this is a huge print. Oh, this is a really small print. You also, when selling vintage, you cannot assume that this entire bolt is pristine. You cannot assume that, you know, this, you know, three foot yard piece of thing is, you know, without defects. So then what you have to do is you have to go through almost with a fine tooth comb, like hold it up to a light fixture, kind of feel like you're tracing something on a window. You have to really make sure that you're getting those defects. So that's what I, I try and do for all of my pieces. This estate sale has proved challenging because, you know, maybe the outer layer is damaged, but the inner ones are fine. Or reverse card, maybe they cut it somewhere along the way and I didn't catch the little fibers there from the cut line and I sold it thinking it was one 10 yard piece and it's actually two five yard pieces. Right. So it's been a challenge for sure, because you try and just photograph everything that you can to be like, Oh yes, here's this defect. Oh yes, here's this, you know, here's the scale, but it is challenging because I'm not mood or Joanne's, you know, I don't, don't have a whole staff. Uh, it's basically me and one other person who works like two days a week. <laughs> so basically me. <laughs> Talking about that damage, you basically have to unwrap the whole roll to see that, don't you? You do, if you're going to sell it for the maximum amount that it's going to be worth. Okay. Which I have done. There are some. Uh, I have some vintage bark cloths that absolutely, I unrolled that bad boy. I was like, I want to know what defects there are. Because this is, you know, it's this really cool rope print from the oh, 60s. I know exactly what you're talking about. I remember that one. It's gorgeous. It colors? Didn't you have it in two colors? I still do, in orange and pink. And I unrolled that entire thing to make sure there was no like giant whatevers because I knew I was going to charge the the top end for it because it's so rare. I've literally never seen it before. Like you see bark cloth all the time with like big flowers and big, you know, vases and things like that. That's pretty standard. They're very pretty, but it's pretty standard. This rope print is literally nothing I've seen before. So because of that, I unrolled the whole thing. I went over it with a fine tooth comb. Yeah, you have to be committed. Or 
in my case, when you're not as committed and it's, you know, some of the, the double knits that are solid colors that, you know, have dirt along the bottom that that does wash out, but I'm not going to wash thousands upon thousands of yards of fabric. So what I do is I disclose it. I take a photo of it and I mark it down. I don't charge a whole lot for those because I know that the person that is receiving this fabric is then going to have to do more work. It's not going to be the bark cloth. That's basically good to go. Just pre-wash it. That's the only thing you got to do because I did not wash the bark cloth because I don't want to iron that many yards of bark cloth. <laughs> that's like, it was like 40 some odd yards when it started a bark cloth. I was like, no, no, that's, that's not what we're doing here. <laughs> And also a lot of people don't like to buy fabric that's been pre-washed, which I find intriguing. Yeah. Yeah. I find that intriguing too. I think that's because then they'll have to pre-wash what they're, they're sewing it with, but uh, yeah. What do you do to prevent undesirables coming into your home? I'm thinking of insects. I'm thinking of mold. There's probably some other things. You do the best that you can. Also remember I live in Florida. So like, uh, you know, you can have the most bug treated house and you will still have bugs. They will not be all, they're not everywhere. It's not an infestation, but like you don't get away with not having a bug or two in your house in Florida. You literally don't. I'm so sorry. If you want to move to Florida, that's the reality of it. We have some persistent little buggers, pun intended. Once it's in my, like once it's in the house, like I'm really making sure that what I tend to do is I tend to like vacuum out the crevices. So, you know, you're vacuuming out. We're making sure that like everything stays relatively clean. So that way that doesn't get into the house. Thankfully, mold isn't too bad because we have a, we have a pretty good air conditioner. We keep our house at 72 because I am from Ohio and I cannot handle it any warmer. I literally can't. If it's 73, I notice it immediately in this house because it just gets kind of humidity and sticky and icky, which is a bad thing, not only for me as a person, but also for vintage paper and vintage fabrics. Do you have regular customers that are just looking for the next listing? Sometimes I do. Uh, there are definitely, I have a dedicated group of buyers, I will say, who like I see their names pop up all the time. And it makes me smile because I'm like, oh, good. I'm so glad I had more for you. But it's really, it's it's a nice balance of repeat customers and new folks. It's, a, it's the place that I want to be as a business. I want people to trust me enough to return to my shop over and over. And I also want to have new folks be trusting enough in this small business that, they, you know, maybe they never heard of. Maybe they don't know of my YouTube channel. Maybe they just found me because they searched for a certain pattern name. And, you know, my website popped up because I have said pattern you know whether you've sold any to designers that work for movie sets or TV? I do. Um, I actually just sold one to a movie house in Las Vegas. I also recently sold um, some fabric to the personal designer for Trixie Mattel. So if you saw the Argyle trailer that Trixie Mattel did in that crazy fun harlequin you know light blue pink flowered fabric that's from me that is from my shop and i just like i geeked out like what <laughs> yeah i have a friend who made the bags for the last of us and she said she had to make 10 versions of every bag yeah i believe it but that's really cool yeah that was good. <laughs> yeah, the same thing i'm looking at the thing where are the yeah. bags where are the bags? Which one? See that bag <laughs> So you were a stage manager. What skills as a stage manager did you bring with you to this business? The ability to multitask and keep things organized. Because without that, you would have no idea where your stock is. My husband will occasionally come in. He's like, wait a minute. How are you editing a video, scanning your patterns, and able to also like check in and like make sure that your, your, the packages are getting filled? It was like, it's called multitasking. That's one of your main skills as a stage manager is the ability to read the music, call the cue, keep an eye on the singer, keep an eye on maestro, and also be listening in case someone needs you over here. So like that has literally been my job for so long that now it's just, I'm editing my video. 
I'm scanning patterns to list tomorrow or tonight. And I'm talking him through how to fill the orders when he helps. He's floored. It's like, wait, how do you do that? And I'm like, that's the stage manager in me. Have you ever gotten into um, sewing machines? No, because I... Hmm. You have, a line. <laughs> you have a line that you do not cross? Yeah, pretty much. Because I have a feeling that I would not... And it would not end well. I'm not saying that I have a sewing machine that I bought specifically for a video that the box is what my computer is currently sat on. We're dabbling, but we're not going to go whole hog here. <laughs> Would I love to have, you know, all the machines for all the different things? Yeah, sure. That'd be great. But it's not really practical for, for me and the, the level of sewing that I do. What I do is pretty accomplishable on my, you know, nice little Bernina it's 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 fine well, you're a bernita girl so am i yeah which one do you have oh i have my mother's so it's the bernina artista 730 so if a person was going out to buy a vintage pattern or vintage fabrics what would be the advice that you could share on um, what to look for or how not to make a mistake biggest thing for anybody make sure that you know your measurements whether it's bust waist hips, whether it's chest waist hip, you know, you know, is your arm the thing that bothers you? Like as far as like the, you know, not being too tight, like make sure you know that measurement. You have to know your measurement. The measurement is just a number. It means nothing about who you are as a person. You are a wonderful human being, any size. These are just numbers. That's it. You have to know that when you're buying vintage patterns because you may not be able to go out and just off the antique store shelf or off my website buy a, for me, bust 48 pattern. So then you have to be able to make sure that you know for sure which measurement you want to get closest to. Number two, for fabric, please remember that the widths of the fabrics listed on the back of the pattern usually are between 35 inches and 44. That's pretty much your standard until around the mid 60s where they started to get rid of, they got rid of the 35s, they got rid of the 36s, they got rid of the 39s, they would do like 42s. You really have to check what width they are asking for, for your yardage. Because if you're going to do a 1940s pattern, out of modern material, you are not going to need all the yardage that they're talking about on the back of that <laughs> because they're probably only giving you measurements for 35 and 39. And the other thing, the most important thing with fabric, if we're just going fabric standing alone, you need to make sure that it's not dry rotted or it's starting to decompose. So dry rot is for natural fibers. Uh, devil dust is for synthetic fibers. So this glorious 1940s border print. Oh, look at that. When This is a full cotton is what this is. Full cotton fabric right here. I am taking the cut end that has no weaknesses. None. Oh. Dry rotted as crap. You can make something out of this. It's called curtains. And they aren't going to last long. And how does you, dry, dry rot happen in fabric? Honestly, the exact science of it, I don't know. What I do know is that as the material breaks down, it's usually because of poor storage. So either the material got too hot or it got too wet and all the molecules just started to break down. But what I do know is that once it gets to that point, it's if it if it's a piece of clothing that you have that keeps shredding and you're not doing anything, probably dry rotted, and there's not a whole lot you can do at and that you, point. And you said devil dust for polyesters. Yes, devil dust for polyester, um, or acetates, or you know any synthetic fiber. So that's a powder that you see. You'll feel it. Oh, you will touch that fabric. You will come away and it will feel like there's tiny little bits of sand or grit on your fingers that is devil dusting 
And the most important thing with devil dusting is you get that away from any other fabric as fast as humanly possible. Because believe it or not, devil dust can transfer because that's actually a type of rot or a type, it, it can go from fabric to fabric. So if you have something in your closet that every time you touch it, it's coming away, get it out of your closet, get it out of your closet immediately because that can transfer from fabric to fabric if you have it next to other things. So if people want to see more of you or want to see the story of the estate sale and all that stuff that you got, how do they find you? Uh, you can find me on YouTube, youtube.com slash Stephanie Canada. And do you have a newsletter or a website that they can visit? I do have a website for selling my lovely finds. That is backroomfinds.com. If you're just looking to go like gather up your stash, or you just want to see what I found. That's where you find me there. Great. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today, Stephanie. You've shared so much information and lots of great stories. And nice that you have a little bit of Canada in you too. <laughs> just a little. <laughs> thank you so much for having me on. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Stephanie Canada. I loved her take on these vintage patterns. They were like time traveling. And it's so wonderful to see how all these old sewing items can have a new life. If you want to catch one of her videos, I'll leave a link to her YouTube channel in the notes below. And I'll also have links to her website, social media pages, and her email. Next time you're in your sewing room, be sure to have Karen's Quilt Circle playing on in the background. I have interviewed so many interesting and amazing people on this show. Let one inspire you. And don't forget to check out last week's video. Take care and I'll see you next time.